Good evening and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum at the Institute of Politics. My name is Alyssa Gaines and I'm a sophomore studying social studies and history of art at the college and I'm a member of the JFK Junior Forum Committee. Before we begin, please note the exit doors which are located on both the park side and the JFK street side. In the event of an emergency, walk to the exit closest to you and congregate in the JFK park. Please also take a moment now to silence your cell phones and join me in welcoming Robert Fogel. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum. My name is Robert Fogel. I'm a junior here at the college, and I'm the former chair of the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum Student Committee. We are delighted to welcome you all tonight for a conversation on public service and some of the most pressing issues facing our world today. Tonight, we are joined by former Secretary of Defense, Director of the CIA, White House Chief of Staff, and Congressman from California, Leon Panetta. Secretary Panetta began his 50-year career in public service in 1964 as a first lieutenant in the U.S. Army, receiving the Army Commendation Medal. Secretary Panetta's son, Congressman Jimmy Panetta, was elected to Congress in 2016 and currently serves on the House Committee on Ways and Means, the House Committee on Armed Services, and the House Committee on the Budget. He serves as a Chief Deputy Whip in the 118th Congress. Prior to his election to Congress, Panetta served as an intelligence officer in the U.S. Navy Reserve. In 2007, Congressman Panetta volunteered for active duty and was deployed to Afghanistan in support of Operation Enduring Freedom and was awarded the Bronze Star for Meritorious Service. This conversation tonight will be moderated by Karen Donfried, former Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs. Donfried has served as had served as president of the German Marshall Fund uh, of the United States and special assistant to the president and senior director for European Affairs on the National Security Council at the White House. Now, please meet, join me in welcoming our panelists to the stage. Good evening, a welcome to all of you and an especially warm welcome to Secretary Panetta and Congressman Panetta. For me, Secretary Panetta is a living legend for those of us who believe in public service. So it is such a treat to have him here and clearly Congressman Panetta got the public service gene. So it's wonderful to have the two of them on stage together. Now, I have been told that there is a third Panetta in the house. I will not embarrass her further, but we are thrilled she is here. So I just had so much fun thinking what questions I could ask these two. And I thought I would start by referencing the incredible proliferation of foreign and security policy challenges that face this administration. We have Russia's war against Ukraine. We have a rising China that's asserting itself aggressively in many fora. We have a Hamas attack on Israel that has sparked a war between Israel and Hamas and many are worried about a wider war in the Middle East. We have the Houthi rebels firing at ships in the Red Sea. I could go on. Secretary Panetta, you have been in so many positions of responsibility. How do you think about prioritizing when you have all of these crises coming at you? Well, uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me. I've had the chance to come to the school in the past and uh, really enjoy it and enjoy uh, the students that are here. Uh, David is a good friend and uh, we've uh, worked together and also comment together. Um, and uh, it's good to be here to give you at least one hour that I would call the Italian hour uh, between my son and I. <laughs> 
Uh, good to be with Jimmy. Uh, look, we, we are living in dangerous times. Uh, I think the number of flashpoints that you just talked about, uh, there are more flashpoints in the world today than I think since World War II. There are that many. And, you know, part of it is in this larger context of autocracy versus democracy. Uh, and democracy is under siege. Putin invades Ukraine to get rid of their democracy. Hamas attacks Israel uh, to, and goes after the only democracy in the Middle East. Uh, and China's threatening to go after the democracy in Taiwan. Uh, so there are a number of challenges right now. And if I was chief of staff to the president, I think what I would strongly recommend is that this is a moment in time to build alliances, not to walk away from alliances. That it is critical, as we saw in Ukraine, to have a president work with NATO to be able to put together a package of assistance for Ukraine and also draw the line on Putin. I think we should be doing the same thing uh, in the Middle East, working with moderate Arab nations and Israel to build an alliance that can deal with both Iran and terrorism, and Hamas, obviously. Uh, same thing is true in China. You know, the ability to have South Korea, Japan, Australia, India, the Quad, working together with ASEAN countries and building that into a strong Pacific alliance would give us a real platform to be able to deal with Xi in China. Uh, the same, you know, we, we ought to be doing the same thing, very frankly, in Central and Latin America. We ought to be doing the same thing in Alaska. Uh, Alaska, uh, in uh, Africa. So we ought to be able to develop the alliances that mean that the United States alone isn't going to have to deal with all these, but rather allows the United States to be a world leader working with allies in dealing with all of these crises. So Secretary Panetta, I'm sure you heard the comments that Donald Trump made at a campaign rally on Saturday, <laughs> where he was referring to arguably our most important alliance, the NATO alliance, and essentially said if he said he told the president of a NATO country that if they were not paying enough for defense, we wouldn't defend them. And then he went so far as to say, in fact, I would encourage Vladimir Putin to attack you. Now, most of the reaction to those comments have suggested alarm, both from Democrats and Republicans on Capitol Hill, certainly from European allies. Senator Lindsey Graham was saying, oh, I don't think he'd actually withdraw from NATO. Don't misunderstand this. I think he's sort of hitting an alarm bell. But how do you manage that? The likely Republican nominee speaking publicly about a key alliance in those terms. It, it, uh, it really attacks American credibility, even though uh, everybody kind of knows Trump uh, and knows what he's about and knows that he tried to be an isolationist when he was president, withdrawing from our alliances. Uh, but the mere fact that he said what he did, which is to essentially give Putin a license to go into other NATO countries if they aren't paying 2% is crazy. I mean, it is, it, what it says to Europe is that the United States, is, if he's elected, is not going to be there. And the NATO alliance without the United States' leadership uh, is, is really difficult to bring together the countries in NATO. I've been there, you've been there, Brussels, uh, and, uh, you know, everybody does their talking points. Everybody protects their, uh, their country. But the fact that they were able to come together and join together in dealing with Ukraine was really, I think, a major step for NATO. 
and it's what other alliances can do as well. Uh, I think now there is a real problem that there's a message of weakness going to the world from the United States for several things. Number one, the Congress has not moved the aid package providing aid to Ukraine, aid to Taiwan, aid to Israel. They're still struggling. I think there's some hope they may try to pass something this week. I hope they do. But the fact that it's taken a few months to do a necessary package, what does that say to the rest of the world? And, you know, if you go abroad, people are asking the question, what the hell is going on in the United States? Is the United States going to be there or not? And right now, the combination of dysfunction in Washington, combined with the failure to pass the aid package, combined now with Trump's comments, let me tell you something. It is undermining our credibility as a world leader. And that's dangerous. It is dangerous because, let me tell you, if the United States doesn't lead, Nobody else will right now. That's the problem. So that was a perfect setup for Congressman Panetta. And I absolutely wanted to ask you about the supplemental spending bill that may or may not be coming to the House. But your father mentioned we have more flashpoints perhaps since than we've had since World War II. And that supplemental actually captures many of them. It has funding for Ukraine, it has funding for Israel, it has funding for the Indo-Pacific. The initial idea was, well, if we connect it to the crisis on our southern border, that increases the chances of it getting through Congress. Well, it turned out that was not the way to get it through. So now we see the Senate moving on an assistance only or a no border bill. It looks like the Senate may pass that bill this week. Speaker Johnson in the House has not been a fan of it. It is not clear he will take up that legislation, given the opposition to it from some of the hard right Republican members in the House. Take out your crystal ball, please. <laughs> And share with us how you think Congress will manage this. Yeah, great. Well, thank you, Madam Secretary. And thanks to the uh, uh, Harvard School of Government and, uh, of course, the IOP, and giving me this opportunity not only to spend time with my dad, but have lunch and dinner with my daughter uh, who attends <laughs> here. So I appreciate that. Um, look, I, gotta, I admit, last week was a very difficult week for me as to what happened and what transpired in the United States Senate was one of those head scratching moments that, you know, look, I'm used to dysfunction in Congress. Okay, I get it. And a lot of what my dad is saying and what you were saying, what we're reading about today with the ex president making these types of comments, it gives me post traumatic stress because I came in with Trump. I had four years of dealing with statements like this guy's made today, not just talking about NATO, not just talking about our allies, not just talking about Russia but the immigration steps that this president is going to take and what he talked about today, you should see it on the news, it's unbelievable. Um, and I think the way we deal with it is to continue to make sure that our checks and balances are in place. We continue to make sure that we stand firm in pushing back if he does come into office, just like we did for the last four years. Don't get me wrong, there's always opportunity to work with people who wanna work with you, and there were some wins that we got with uh, uh, President Trump. But right now, seeing the effect that he's having on members of Congress um, is really disturbing. Uh, look, you had my colleague here, Mike Gallagher, uh, and Raja Krishnamorsi uh, just before. Uh, Mike Gallagher is one of the most uh, smart, members, smart, productive members of Congress, he's leaving Congress. Now I know a part of that is personal, but I believe a part, a part of it is professional as well. And that being a Republican, I'll never forget my freshman year, so let me digress real quick. My freshman year walking out, so Trump had just come in, Mike and I had just gotten to office, and we're walking out after a late night vote, we're walking down the steps of a Capitol, and I look over at Mike, and he's just shaking his head. I said, Mikey, what's up? 
And he's like, man, this guy, talking about the president at the time, this guy, it's damned if you do, if damned if you don't. If I speak out against him, I get kicked the crap out of me by my right. If I don't speak out against him, that crap gets, out of me, gets kicked out of me from the left. I mean, that's the predicament that some of these members are in, and unfortunately it gets to the point where they've had enough of it. Now, if you read David Brooks's op-ed um, on Friday, in which he talked about what happened last week, and how basically, you know, he understands the effect of Trump on Republicans, but now he said Trump has basically gotten their heads. And I kind of, you saw that in what the Senate did. And that basically Democrats wanted funding for Ukraine, wanted funding for Israel, for Asia, and humanitarian aid. And the Republicans said, well, we want border too. They saw a chance for leverage. They saw a chance for basically there to be border security. What did we do? We said, okay, James Lankford, very, Repu very conservative Republican senator, Chris Murphy, very liberal Democratic senator, and Kirsten Sinema, an independent from Arizona, all got together. Four months of very difficult negotiations. And trust me, when it comes to immigration, in my limited time in Congress, that is the most politically toxic, policy complex issue to be worked on in the United States Congress. There's a reason why it hasn't been solved yet, and that's part of it. But when you throw Donald Trump in the mix, it makes it very, very difficult. So what happens? They get a deal, a damn good deal as well. The most conservative bipartisan legislation on immigration this decade. I mean, Democrats really didn't get anything. Normally when we talk border security, we want DACA, we want farm workers, we want a pathway for citizenship for those that are here who've contributed to our economy and our community. We didn't get any of that. Why? Because we knew how important it is, based on the words that my dad just spoke and based on the words that many of you speak and know, how important it is to fund Ukraine right now, to fund Israel, to fund humanitarian aid, and to fund our Indo-Pacific partners. And so we basically gave up the push for immigration reform to get border security, and then yes, to get the, the funding. We gave it to him. Donald Trump comes in and they caved to him. They absolutely kowtowed to the ex-president. We gave them what they wanted. The president said, don't do it, purely for political purposes, purely to have as an issue to run on, to hurt Joe Biden, to help Donald Trump going forward. And let me tell you, if he says he's gonna fix it in 20, if he gets elected, it ain't gonna happen. Because in order to do any sort of immigration reform, you not only need the House, you need 10 more in the Senate. You need 60 in the Senate. And they're just not, they don't have the numbers right now. So this was the perfect opportunity to fix the border, to provide funding, and Trump blew it up. So now we are left with funding. And I guess today, from what I've been reading and following, they, they're on a path to sending it over, to vote on it and send it over to the House. Now the issue is the Speaker what Speaker Johnson is going to do. And to be frank, I don't know what he's going to do. He's had some discussions about how he may piecemeal parts of it, but we saw he tried to do that with Israel funding. That didn't include humanitarian funding, and that failed. And so hopefully, hopefully, and as you know, the Speaker's kind of learning on the fly right now, understandably so, um, hopefully he does the right thing, and that's really all we can do right now is uh, just kind of hope that um, he understands how important it is, based on what my dad said, based on what we know, how important it is for the United States to lead in this moment, and that definitely starts with the supplemental funding package. So I want to stay with that just for a minute because I agree with you, it is a critical moment to get that supplemental through. And as someone who's worked a lot on Ukraine, it's nothing short of existential to get that 60 billion to Ukraine as they face this invasion from Russia. And I'm gonna go and be congressional nerdy for a minute, but we've heard Republicans in the Senate say, okay, what the Democrats need to do is use a discharge pet petition to circumvent Speaker Johnson's will and improve the bill's chances in the House. I think probably all of us would love to have you, Congressman, explain to us what a discharge petition is and how likely is such a move to succeed? Yeah, um, a discharge petition is, oh, so they say, I've never seen it work in my seven years in Congress. Let's make that clear. I've seen plenty of discharge petitions. I've signed plenty of discharge petitions. 
but I've never seen it work. What it is is a way to go around leadership, supposedly, to bring a bill to the House floor. How do you do that? You get 290 signatures, excuse me, excuse me, say I take that back, 219, a majority of, of the House signatures, 435 members, 219 signatures on that petition, it's supposed to then send the bill to the floor. However, one, I've never seen that because I've never seen, and I've signed plenty of them, I've never seen the other side step up and get to that 219. Okay, let's make that clear. I've never seen enough. We've had plenty on immigration reform. We signed discharge petitions. I never saw enough Republicans sign it. They're, they signed discharge petitions as well. When they were in the minority, Democrats never signed their issues as well. So when you have to deal with the numbers and whether or not there are members of Congress who are gonna go against leadership, go against Donald Trump on an issue like this. Two, what I've heard is that if you do get 219 signatures on that discharge petition, it can then get killed by being sent to the appropriate committee and the committee can then kill it because obviously you're going to have the chairman who's gonna listen to the speaker and kill that as well. So as much as we'd like to think a discharge petition would move the bill forward, I mainly look at it as more of a messaging system as well. Because trust me, if you got 219 signatures on a bill, that's a damn good thing. And it should get moved, not just by discharge petition, but by other ways. But unfortunately, there's ways to kill it, and I, that's what can happen. Okay. And I, have, you, have you ever seen a dis, did you ever have a dis, you guys never had a majority, yeah, <laughs> no. exactly. We, we decided it was better to basically do what we're supposed to do. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> so, Secretary Panetta, many would argue that the major challenge the United States is facing in the 21st century is China. And we saw the national security strategy that the Biden administration wrote in 2022 identify the PRC as the only competitor with the intent and increasingly the capability to reshape the international order. Is the US rising to that challenge? And how do you see the US-China relationship going forward? Well, again, it goes back to uh, being one of those flashpoints uh, that we're having to deal with in the world. Uh, and uh, it is, it's critical because China is strong. They've got a, you know, uh, an economy uh, it's struggling right now, but but generally they're still, you know, working on technology, working on uh, artificial intelligence, and uh, all of the new technology that's going to be critical for the future. Uh, and China represents uh, a real threat in terms of the region and the world. Now, look. It, it's changed a little bit. Uh, when I met with Xi, I was uh, both actually director of the CIA and then Secretary of Defense, and met with Xi both in Washington and in Beijing. And, you know, normally when you have these meetings with the president of China, as you would know, uh, it's a, you basically exchange talking points. You have to go through interpreter, takes a long time. So everybody works off of their talking points, does the talking points, you wait for the interpreter to go through it. Uh, and so it really drags on. Interestingly enough with Xi, he didn't want to use the talking points. The talking points usually relate to Taiwan, to the Uyghurs, to other things that, they, that aggravate them. Uh, and he basically wanted to kind of talk to me directly. And at that point, he was concerned because we were rebalancing to the Pacific uh, as part of our new defense policy for the 21st century. We were basically going to add a carrier and other ships uh, to the Pacific. And he complained about that. He said, you know, why, why are you rebalancing to the Pacific and threatening China? I said, look, the United States is a Pacific power. China is a Pacific power. 
we have, we, we are going to obviously exert influence in the Pacific, just like you exert influence in the Pacific. You're a Pacific power, we're a Pacific power. Why aren't we working together on issues like North Korea, on issues of trade, on issues related to freedom of the seas and other areas? We should be working together. And she, to his credit, said, you know, we should. We, because, frankly, that's the best way to achieve peace and prosperity. Those were his words. Now, in the last number of years, and, and I've kind of made this comment generally when you talk about autocracy versus democracy, I think they sensed a weakness in the United States, the autocrats, particularly Putin and Xi. Uh, Putin, you know, we, they went into Crimea, pay, he paid no price. The Russians went into Syria, paid no price. The Russians went into Georgia, paid no price. The Russians conducted probably the boldest cyber attack against our election system in this country, did not pay a price. And then add to that Afghanistan, and I think it sent a message of weakness on the part of the United States. I think she shares that same view that the United States was, was, is not, you know, has lost its strength and its willingness to draw the line. And so she has been much more aggressive uh, in terms of challenging Taiwan, militarizing the South China Sea, developing their military, and they are investing a tremendous amount in their military. This is not what you would call a status quo military. They're investing in a military that can, in fact, go to war in the future. So for all of those reasons, it's really important for the United States to be able, number one, look, I think it's important to have a dialogue with China and to be able to talk with Xi and to talk with others. But you have to do that from strength, okay? The United States is gonna deal with China. They have, we have got to be strong. Strong militarily, strong diplomatically. We've gotta have a strong economy. So we have got to invest in new technologies. Now I'm glad Congress, Congress passed the CHIP bill. Uh, because the United States needs to develop chips on our own uh, and not rely on others. Uh, I'm glad that we are investing in technology and research uh, on the defense bill and trying to make sure that we have a military that is first rate. We're the strongest military in the face of the earth right now. We've got to maintain that position in order to deal with China. So I am one that believes We've got to be strong. We've got to see where China's trying to develop its capability. I mean, you know, they've got this Belt and Road Initiative where they're basically going into countries and building things, building infrastructure, and trying to have those countries as a result become marketplaces for China. Those countries are recognizing that that's what China's up to. The United States ought to be engaging with the world as well. You know, I, I, I am not a believer that we should be isolationists when it comes to trade. We live in a global world. The United States produces great products. We ought to be competing in that world. And we ought to be expanding our trade relationships rather than walking away from the trade agreement uh, the way uh, Trump did uh, with the uh, ASEAN countries uh, in the Pacific, we ought to be renewing that trade agreement. So there are areas we can build up strength and make clear to the world that, you know, we're prepared to try to help the world move hopefully towards greater democracy. That's what the United States is all about. But if we get, if we get into a position where all we want to do is somehow confront China uh, and, and, and face them directly in some, in some kind of military uh, conflict, such as Taiwan, I think that is going to undermine our ability 
to try to build a, a China and a Pacific that can have peace and prosperity in the future. Secretary Panetic, I want to pay, play devil's advocate for a minute because whatever one may think of Donald Trump personally, whatever one may think about the way he expresses himself, there is a large swath of Americans with whom his message resonates. And you talked about we can't be weak, we need to be strong. And Donald Trump is saying, look, if I were still president, Putin never would have invaded Ukraine. If I were president, you wouldn't have this problem in the Middle East. So, you know, to, to those Americans with whom this message resonates, who say the Europeans should be doing more, the various criticisms that he has, how would you engage that part of the population and say, here's why, you believe he would be extremely destructive to U.S. interests in the world? It's, you know, it, it is a concern that what we're seeing is a part of the population that supports Trump uh, is angry and frustrated. Look, I often tell the students at our institute that in a democracy we govern, by leadership or by crisis? By leadership or crisis? If leadership is there and willing to take the risks associated with leadership and make no mistake about it, you wanna be a leader, you're gonna to have to take risks. That's the nature of leadership. And a willingness to make a decision. And it can be a tough decision. And it can anger your base. But if you think it's the right thing for the country, that's what you should do. If we don't have that kind of leadership, we'll govern by crisis. And very frankly, in the United States for the last few years, we have largely governed by crisis. You gotta shut the government down in order to deal with the budget. And rather than dealing with the budget, you do a CR, uh, and they've done three CRs now in the Congress, uh, rather than confronting the budget issue. So, a lot of, when that happens, and it's easy to do, you wait for crisis, you don't have to make tough decisions, don't have to raise people's taxes, don't have to cut their spending, just kind of wait for crisis. But there's a price to be paid, and the price is you lose the trust of the American people in our system of governing. And so that's why there's a lot of anger and a lot of frustration out there, is because they see the demo our democracy not functioning the way it should to deal with the problems that have to be done. Look, I, I've said in my over 50 years of public life, I've seen Washington at its best and Washington at its worst. The good news is I've seen Washington work. I have seen Republicans and Democrats work together. When I was there, Tip O'Neill was the speaker. But he had a great friend called Bob Michael, who was the minority leader. Did they fight each other in elections? Yes. Did they have political disputes? Of course. But when it came to big issues, they worked together. They got things done. And what you have to do in order to reach people who are angry and frustrated is you've got you've to get things done. You've got to make some tough decisions. You've got to be able to take on some heavy risks. I understand that, it's not easy. You know, I worked on a budget agreement with George Bush Sr. And in order to deal with the, with the deficit at that time, we put everything on the table. We came up with an agreement that raised taxes, that dealt with entitlements, and that, that put caps on discretionary spending, both discretionary spending and defense spending. You think that's easy? No, it's a tough vote. But we did it. And it ultimately, that plus what we did in the Clinton administration, produced a balanced budget. Clinton enjoyed a lot of support, and he was worried. He was worried that if he was going to raise taxes and do things, he'd probably lose the next election. Didn't happen. Because the economy got better, and because the country looked at that and said, damn it, they're willing to do the right thing. So. I think part of the answer 
is you got to be willing to do the right thing. And let me address that. Let me defend some of the work we have been doing <laughs> um, at this point. Look, I, obviously, there is, it, look, it's similar not just on the right, it's similar to my extreme left. There are certain people that are so pissed off, you're not going to be able to reason with them. And people like that, especially on the right, at least in the explanation that I've had given to me by my Republican colleagues, Donald Trump is their middle finger for them. It goes to what my dad was saying. And, and a lot of people these days are voting, not with their head, not with their wallet even, which is a little disturbing, but they're not. It's more with their gut and what they're feeling. And I completely do agree with my dad in that we have to do what I heard James Carville tell Joe Biden, uh, basically give an interview in which the moderator asked Carville, he said, what would you tell the president right now? And this was after Afghanistan. Well, even now, it's after Afghanistan, the Afghanistan debacle, pull out of a pullout. And basically, you know, Biden's ratings started to come low. And Carville said, without skipping a beat, soldier on, soldier on, keep on doing what you're doing. And you know what? We did. Because let me tell you about the stuff that unfortunately a lot of people are not hearing about the work that we've done. Yes, I get it. You see a lot of division. You see a lot of dysfunction. That's front and center on the news. That's sexy. That's what sells. But let's talk about the American Rescue Plan in which we passed and got us out of COVID and gave us a foundation to deal with the global inflation. Let's talk about the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Basically, where past administrations only talked about infrastructure investment, we gave you 10 years of infrastructure investment. Let's talk about the Chips and Science Act that bolstered our domestic manufacturing, especially when it comes to semiconductor chips. Let's talk about the largest investment in human history to reduce our carbon output in the Inflation Reduction Act. That also included a cap on insulin at $35 a month for those on Medicare, a cap on out-of-pocket expenses at $2,000 a year for those on Medicare. These are some big bills that we got done in the 117th Congress, most of them bipartisan. We also did something on reducing gun violence, the Safer Communities Act that many of us have forgot about, that invested in our red flag laws, that invested in mental health, and invested in school safety. What about the PACT Act for our veterans, those who were exposed to toxic fumes, our generation of veterans who were exposed to these burn pits to make sure the burden is lower so that the VA actually sees them and cares for them and their families. We made Juneteenth a national holiday. We codified Asian hate crimes. We codified same-sex marriage. These are big bills that we got passed that we forget about. Don't get me wrong, I get it. Good governing is not sexy. But to my dad's point, Good governing is what we do. I realize there are people who get into this position, they think they're in the entertainment industry, or as Mike Gallagher, I'm sure, said earlier, a great line, he said, the people use Congress as a green room for MSNBC and Fox News. <laughs> it's true, there are those members. But I gotta tell you, for the most part, there actually are Democrats and Republicans in the middle, not those on the extremes that you're not gonna be able to negotiate with and talk to. But if you focus on those in the middle, not just in Congress, but in the public and in our constituency, to me, that's how you remind them what we've done, but also that's how you give them faith in the institution, in Congress, and ultimately restore our faith in our democracy. So I want to encourage anyone who has questions to go to the mics, because I'm very happy to bring you into this conversation. And it's interesting, because I wanted to ask you both about your decisions to spend your careers in public service. But actually, without my asking that directly, I think what each of you just said tells all of us why you made the decisions you did and why it's been so meaningful in your own lives to be part of something that's larger than yourselves and working for a goal you believe in. And as we continue the conversation, feel free to add more on that, because I know there are students here who are really eager also to serve. Um, but let's bring in folks from the audience. And please introduce yourself yeah. and ask a question. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Barack Sella. I'm a mid-career MPA student here at the Kennedy School. So sometimes as an outsider looking at the US, it seems like the only thing that 
Democrats and Republicans today have in common is their dissatisfaction from the United States foreign policy. If, it, if it's uh, Ukraine, if it's Israel and Gaza, if it's China, and a general sense that American citizens are sort of in the phase of um, isolationism. You can say maybe both sides have some level of America first when it comes to America's policy. But it seems that you both sort of have a different opinion. What is the American public not understanding about the importance of um, America's foreign policy? And with all the tensions and you know the bills that are stuck, where do you see America's pol foreign policy going in the next few years? You know, uh, I'm a believer that if you're president of the United States, you have a responsibility to educate the American people uh, and make them understand why it's necessary for us to do certain things. And the problem is that presidents of late, I mean, you know, look, FDR during World War II spent time talking to the American people in fireside chats during a world war to make sure they understood what the hell was going on and the sacrifices that had to be made. You know, and Eisenhower did that, and Kennedy did that, uh, and Clinton did that. Uh, presidents don't like to use the Oval Office anymore, and I, I can understand it. You're, you're living in a world of social media. How the hell do you get social media and others to be able to reach the people you need to reach? But the problem is that presidents don't spend enough time bringing the American people along. Look, there's justification for, for supporting Ukraine in a battle for democracy. I happen to think Ukraine in many ways is fighting our battle. They're not just defending their democracy. Frankly, they're defending democracy in the 21st century. If Putin wins in the Ukraine, you know, democracy is going to take a big hit. That's an important issue. We need to be involved. We need to be involved in dealing, you know, with uh, the problems in Israel and the Middle East. We're, we need to be involved when we're confronting Kim Jong-un in North Korea who's building uh, not only nuclear weapons, but missiles to deliver those nuclear weapons. We need to deal with Iran and the supreme leader that are you know, supplying uh, other terrorists to basically undermine uh, that part of the world. We, the, the President of the United States, and very frankly, you know, the, the people that obviously have to, to deliver on, on what he's trying to do, need to make a better case with the American people why this is important. That's, I mean, Trump lo loves to talk about isolationism and withdrawing from the world and America first. Well, you know, I, I can see where that sells a little bit because, you know, if you're having a hard time uh, making a living, if you don't have a very good job, you know, at least this guy's telling you, you know, maybe you need to focus on that. But what, what it ultimately means is that a president of the United States carries a huge responsibility, not just to make decisions about what you do in these areas, but to bring the American people with you and to explain it to them. And I don't think there's enough of that going on. And, you know, he, I think, you know, Biden, who's got a tremendous amount of experience in foreign affairs, I think in some ways assumes that the public gets it. They don't. The public gets what they get on Fox, they get on, get on television, and they get on social media. And those are all mixed messages. And if you're going to be a strong president, trying to unify this country. And by the way, you know, presidents talk about unifying the country. We're further divided than we ever have been. Why? Because 
we're missing a way for presidents to reach the American people. And they've got to spend more time doing that. Otherwise, our democracy is going to continue to crumble. And, and I think, you know, as we all know, these are very complex issues. And unfortunately, these days, and heightened by certain politicians, it's kind of governing by slogan rather than governing by substance, unfortunately. And when you have a complicated issue that you have to talk about, first of all, the messenger has to be articulate and be able to do that. Second of all, you have to be able to do it in a way that appeals to them based on the, the difficulties that we have now with social media and how it is this little what, quick 30 second sound bites, these quick slogans. Um, some people are better at it than others. There's no doubt about that. When I came into Congress in 2017 and we had just lost the, uh, to, you know, uh, Trump came in, you know, and I hear it to this day, you Democrats have to do a better job messaging. Check, I get it. We like to explain things, not so much on the other side, you know? And so we're, it's something I can tell you that is an issue and something that we're continuing to work on. Um, and it, it doesn't mean that you can just do you know, these little quips on social media where the president's got these red eyes. I mean, you know, you, you, you gotta do something else. And I, I believe we're still trying to figure it out. Please, up there, yeah. Good evening, my name is MJ Mehdi. And first of all, thank you for your distinguished service. And my question is for Secretary Panetta. In 2011, the New York Times published a skating article about Barack Obama, President Obama having a quote-unquote kill list for terrorists, and they said it was rather ironic how a Nobel Peace Prize winner had a kill list. And my question was that how much was it of an executive decision on his part compared to having some input from his cabinet members? Thank you. Uh, executive decision on what? On President Barack Obama's part to have that kill list for terrorists as opposed to seeking input from the Secretary of Defense, the Director of the CIA, and other members of his cabinet. President Barack Obama have a kill list. Two, if he did, for terrorists. Uh, Two, if he did, did he get input from his cabinet on Correct, thank you. Decision. Okay. Thank you, Congress. Uh, the answer is, he did, we did have a list. And it's interesting because when I became a CIA director, I went to, to visit my predecessor, Mike Hayden, uh, at uh, Langley. And, you know, I, had, I was raised with uh, CIA doing intelligence and, and basically gathering information and presenting that to uh, the, uh, the leaders uh, in the, in, the, uh, in the White House. And he said something to me that I never forgot, which was he, he said, you're gonna be a combatant commander. I said, what the hell are you talking about? And what he was talking about was an operation that CIA was running to basically go after those who had attacked us on 9-11. I mean, I, I struggle now to try to get Israel to understand they can do targeted operations. They need to go after the leadership of Hamas. And the best way to do that is using counterterrorism capabilities where you target people who were involved in the October 7th attack. That's what they need to do. That's what we did. And in order to do that, we had to identify people who were involved in 9-11 planning. We then had to go to the Justice Department and confirm it. Then we were able to put it on a list and be able to say, these are the people we can, we can go after. And President Obama basically said, I want you to be able to continue to go after the leadership, including bin Laden. So it involved all of that. It was not just the president making an executive decision. There was, in fact, a system, and, and, and look, one, one of the good things about our democracy is there are checks and balances in it. In addition to 
all of the steps I talked about, the legal steps of identifying the people, I also had to go to the committees in the Congress, the intelligence committees on both the House and Senate side. And I sat down with both of them, told them what targets we were going after, told them when we did the operations, uh, and the Congress of the United States, through these committees, basically supported what we were doing. So that's, that, is, that is a good way, frankly, to approach dealing with our enemies. Thank you. Come over here. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, you mentioned um, that you how to do it. Um, this might be laughable with, to some, but where do the American people fit in to figuring this out? Like we vote, and then it feels like the politicians disappear for four years, and then they come back, or they disappear for two years, and then they come back. And we hear this thing where it's like, we want to figure this out, but it feels like it's a closed session all the time. Okay. Um, so where do the American people fit in? And can you just introduce yourself? Oh, Larry Meadows. I'm a doctoral student over at the School of Education. Thanks, Larry. Yeah. Oh, look, I, I, I think we're figuring out the messaging, but we shouldn't be figuring out how we govern. Okay, let's make that clear. Um, you know, I, I believe, based on what I've seen, despite the dysfunction that unfortunately you see on TV and the press likes to highlight, stuff is actually getting done. And that's kind of where we, I think we need, to, where the disconnect can be, where the breakdown is. Because trust me, and I think this is part of the president's messaging, or it should be going into 2024, is to talk, not just talk about everything we've done. We can only talk about that so much. You have to feel it. You have to feel the effects of everything we've done. And I think this is why, this is a big issue that the White House is trying to figure out is why isn't that happening? There's a number of reasons. A lot of it is implementation. We do a good job, I, I have to say, we actually do a good job passing bills and getting them signed into law. We don't do so good of a job implementing the legislation. So like some of the tax credits for the IRA uh, to help reduce our carbon output, basically that hasn't even put, been put out there by the IRS. Um, and, and for the prescription drug pricing, now we're allowed to, the government's going to negotiate with big drug companies. The prices aren't going to come into effect until 2026. So um, I just think it's sort of, sort of the process that we're kind of hurting on right now. We passed some big bills, like I said. It's making sure that people not just know about them. And, you know, I, I completely disagree with politicians just go away. I sure as hell don't go away from my constituency. I'm out and about. I go home every weekend, work in D.C. during the week, go home every weekend. And when I'm home, I'm not home. I'm out in the district because that's my job. And plus, I had been redistricted and I got a 55 percent new voters, which is a whole nother issue. Um, but but like I said, I'm making sure that they see me, they touch me and they feel me and they know what I'm about because that's basically my role. Um, I think going back to my father's point about the president, and I think we all admit this, he and the administration can do a better job getting out there. Right now, um, the president is having a hard time uh, being that messenger. The vice president is having a hard time being that messenger. For the, for the Democratic Party and for the administration and all the work we've done. And so, like I said, um, I'm being honest here. They're still figuring it out. We need to do a better job at that. We need to make sure that people not only understand what we did, but I can't express this in a better way. People have to feel the effects of our work. Let me, let, let, let me mention this. Uh, and, and Jimmy's absolutely right about uh, the record. Uh, the important legislation that's been adopted. But, the, you know, what, at least from my experience, uh, while it's important to have those achievements, the American people kind of say, okay, so they're doing it. Now, what, do you, what are you doing for me today? What are you doing for my kids tomorrow? And I think, what Biden is, is missing is 
You know, and he, because he's asking the same question that Jimmy said, look, you know, I've done all this legislation, I've done all these things, you know, there's some fairly important bills that we've been able to pass. You know what? The American people want a vision about where the hell this country's going in the future. That's what running for president has to be about. It isn't about, look what, at all I, what I did, although that's important to his credibility. He's got to capture what is it that four more years are going to do for this country. For you, each individual, you and your family. Because, you know, whether, I, and we get caught up in the red and blue states. Let me tell you, I've been to the red states. Jimmy's been to the red states. The fact is, families have the same values and the same feelings about what's important. They want to be able to have a good job. They want to be able to raise their kids right. They want to give them a good education. They want to be able to give them decent health care. I mean, America shares some basic values. It's up to the President of the United States to say, how do we deliver on those values so that you can raise your kids right? And so you get a good education, you get good health care, and you get uh, the kind of jobs that are important for you to be able to support your family. That's the vision. Now, David and I worked for a guy who was very good at sensing that. Bill Clinton had, a, had an amazing ability to relate to people. And as Jimmy often says, democracy is about human relationships. It really is about human relationships. And Clinton had this amazing ability to, to look at you, know where you're coming from. First of all, he didn't spend his time just talking at you, he listened. And if you listen, take the time to listen, then you can put yourself in their shoes. And that's what he did. He did that with foreign leaders, he did that with members of Congress. You need to have the ability to sense where are the American people coming from, what are they worried about, and how can I deliver to make sure that they can enjoy the American dream. And we are almost at time, but you have been waiting so patiently. So last brief question over here. No, th th thank you, and thank you for your service. Dwight Hutchins, mid-career from 96, currently on the Dean's Leadership Council. Uh, Secretary, I love the vision that you painted and how government should work and how the, how the, the body politic should work, um, but it doesn't feel like that's how it does work, right? And so the, you, you say, let's talk about all the things we're gonna do. Well, the, the Republican platform, presidential platform, was no platform, right? There was no policy prescription. So then that doesn't give me a vision but it was, the, it was the second largest vote in American history. You know, so there was 70, you know, 10% more people thought that was a good idea than they did four years before. So something resonated, but it wasn't on a platform because there was no platform. In Georgia, where I'm from, uh, Herschel Walker barely lost by 2%. And I don't agree with his were werewolf versus vampire um, platform that he was talking about. So I'm not quite sure what he was offering the American people or the people of Georgia, but 49% of the state thought that he would make a good leader. So how is it that you're giving me this great vision about all, this thing, all these things that should be when 49% of the people are perfectly willing to accept nothing as the answer, and, you know, in a world in which, you know, you've got to feel it, you know, I think women felt Roe v. Ray taken away from them. I think African Americans and other minorities heard the message that the Supreme Court, and yet, so I feel government. And so I know exactly what that is. I'm trying to understand what are these you know, what is the 49% that are willing to vote for nothing feeling, and what are they trying to say? Yeah, you know, in the absence of, of leadership, in the absence of 
you know, the sense that things are, are working and, and that, you know, everybody's trying to solve the problems facing this country. You know what sells in this country? Blow it up. Blow it up. I mean, they're all rotten. They're all in a swamp there in Washington. I mean, that, that, that sells. That sells. Because people are angry and they're frustrated. And, and they, they want to strike out. I understand that. But what I'm saying is, if you're a real leader in this country, if you're trying to get the right thing done, then you have got to take those frustrations and that anger, listen to it, and understand what, why, why are people angry? What are you intend to do to try to deal with that? You, that's, that's what you need to do. Now, it's not easy. I'm not, you know, what I'm describing is not easy. That's why it's not happening. Because it's easier, frankly, for people to govern by crisis than to govern by leadership. Because I don't have to promise anything. I can just let, let things become crisis. And then if the crisis gets bad enough, I've got to try to respond to the crisis. That's easy. But as I said, it undermines the American people's trust in our democracy. And that's what's going on. And the people who campaign on saying our democracy is not working, that there are too many people that aren't really serving the people of this country, that sells. What I'm looking for is somebody that can listen to that frustration, listen to that anger, but then say, these are the steps I think we need to take. Whether it's on dealing with the debt or dealing with the, you know, the, 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 the problem of a bureaucracy that's become so big that it's lost touch with the American people. I mean, th there are steps that can be taken. There are things that people want to hear. But you have to, you've got to say it. And now there are too many messages coming across from too many different directions. And when that happens and when the media, you know, starts putting out their messages in addition, what all of that does is it undermines the willingness of the American people to say, you know what, we've got to roll up our sleeves and we're going to have to sacrifice if we really want to get this done. And that's, nobody talks about sacrifice anymore. If you talk about sacrifice as a politician, you know, people say, what the hell's the matter with you? I don't have to sacrifice. That's why I elected you. Well, you want a democracy? You want to be able to protect this democracy? I'm sorry. You know, you ought to have a sacrifice. I, I know, you know, we were talking a little bit about uh, service to this country. You know what I believe? I believe strongly we need a national service system in this country. I think we need to have young people, you know, be able to serve in some capacity, whether it's in education, whether it's health care, whether it's helping with the aged, whether it's conservation, or whether it's the military. Serve this country in some capacity. Because we owe it to the country. That's what duty to country is all about. Somehow, we've got to get back to that. Well, that is a great note to end on. And I think sort of the banner headline, be an effective leader, you have to figure out how to reach the people you need to reach. And we may not be able to fix that on a national level, but I would say, Secretary Panetta, Congressman Panetta, tonight you reached all of the people who tuned into this. And we thank you for that. Please join me in thanking both of them.